Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to have you. This is brought to you by the Small Business Development Center of New Jersey. This is NJ Thrive, a small business webinar series. We provide weekly webinars created to help all New Jersey small businesses owners to start, grow, and thrive their business. I'm your host, Marjorie Salas, and also an NJSPDC consultant. Today, we'll be talking about tech, our tech team. We are New Jersey's, we're America's Small Business Development Center Network tech team and NJSBDC exclusive technology commercialization team, providing technical support and guidance to eligible investors for SBIR and STTR grants to fund their R&D towards commercialization of tech innovations. Number one, we provide no cost pitch to proposal consulting, training and events starting at zero cost, and exclusive small business tech resources. To learn more, please visit the link below. And as you can see in the map of New Jersey, there will be a location near you wherever you are within the state. Today's agenda. Oh. We have small, if you have a few small business headlines of the week, which they are quite important. The first one is an event on Monday, August 7th about innovating together with Small Business Development Center. This is a uh, an com combined effort of multiple states. Um, we have New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. This is a, a mobile um, an online event, so you're more than welcome to register and attend. Here are all the details. Let me move my bar so I can click on the other one. Uh, on the second headline is GAS Small Business Works 2023, Navigating Equity in Procurement. Uh, this is a, oh, sorry, this is an event starting August 3rd, 2023. Here's the link for free registration. This will be a hybrid event. So please make sure you don't miss out on the opportunities for procurement and everything that has to do with getting your hands with a government contract. Take advantage of this program. And last but not least, something to celebrate is the Small Business Association gets a record high breaking of $163 billion in federal procurement opportunities to small businesses. It's a short read, and it's great because a lot of small businesses are taking advantage of working with the government. Um, this is record high, especially for small business, woman-owned small businesses. You can totally take advantage of this. And here's a breakdown on how it's being distributed. Now, a few things to keep in mind. Please type all your questions in the Q&A box so we are able to answer all of your questions, not in the chat box. Please type all your questions in the Q&A box. And second, please complete a three-minute survey. Once you complete that survey, we will send you this webinar resources. You will get a copy of the presentation that will be shown today. So make sure you complete. It's only three minutes. It probably takes less than that, but it's great feedback for us. And today, where I'm very excited to present Adam Sorkin um, from the National Institute Health Seed Small Business Policy Manager. He's presenting to us Accelerating Innovations with National Institute of Health 
SBIR and STTR programs. Welcome, Adam. Great, thank you so much. And I'm very excited to be here today. Um, all right, and I will go ahead and share my screen. So just bear with me one moment. All right, how does that look? Good, we can see it. Great. Um, yeah, just, uh, I, I, I can't see the chat, so just feel free to pop in if, if anything uh, goes wrong. So uh, thank you so much again for, for having me. I'm, um, I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Um, I, I myself am a uh, um, New Jersey native uh going back a, a a ways so um your state remains very near and dear to my heart and uh i'm excited to work with you all uh so today we're going to dig into information about nih's seed fund and how nih supports biomedical research at small business um in addition we are going to do some myth busting about the program so let's go ahead and get started and uh as as our Marjorie noted, I am Adam Sorkin, the Small Business Policy Manager for the NIH's Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development Office, or NIH SEED, as we like to call ourselves, um, and not by accident. Um, I am going to be covering a lot of information in a pretty short amount of time, um, and I'm probably going to go through a, a lot of it um, too quickly. Um, so. Please just note that um, you can always go to our website, seed.nih.gov, and find a lot of detailed information about most of the things that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, and so, beginning at the beginning, um, NIH is one division of the Department of Health and Human Services, known as HHS. HHS is the overall agency um, that we, we represent and work with. And the HHS mission is to enhance the health and well being of all Americans. There are four components within HHS that um, do participate in the SBIR program. These are NIH, CDC, FDA, and ACL. NIH um, also runs an STTR program as well. The, the other three divisions do not. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on NIH programs today, but please keep in mind that all of these divisions play an important role in supporting biomedical research. All of them offer funding opportunities. And, and in fact, um, when I speak about um, our, our major funding opportunities, um, CDC and FDA actually participate directly in those as well. So you're not just applying to NIH, you're participating to all of these agencies. But um, moving directly to NIH, um, the NIH mission can be summarized primarily as turning discoveries into health. The small business program in particular helps NIH accelerate discoveries um, from bench to bedside and really helps get those innovations into the hands of the patients clinicians, caregivers, and researchers that need them. That This is how one of our major um, vehicles for getting a technology into the lab, out of the lab rather, and um, turned into products that we can all benefit from and improve public health. And so coming up on our first myth, it is easier and better for a company to just get investors and avoid all the work in time to apply for an NIH grant. And believe it or not, I, I do hear this a fair amount. Um, and while getting investors is obviously not a trivial exercise in and of itself, um, these activities can actually go hand in hand and complement each other. Um, so just keep this in mind as I discuss our programs. Um, Companies that receive small business funding um, tend to actually be very attractive to investors and strategic partners. And our programs are designed um, around helping you get that first investor or, or partner moving forward when you 
graduate from our funding programs. So speaking directly, uh, what are the benefits of NIH funding and how do we fit into the whole spectrum? So NIH is the small bit, the NIH small business programs, uh, along with our partners in HHS, um, collectively are one of the largest sources of early stage capital for life sciences in the United States. Uh, we invested over $1.3 billion um, in awards last year. Um, and this is all non dilutive capital. The government takes no equity in debt. Um, you don't have to pay anything back. There are um, some expectations when you take that money uh, that are relatively benign. Um, and uh, this really just uh, is a program here to uh, assist you all in moving your technologies forward so it can benefit um, all Americans. Uh, we fund companies across a spectrum of translational R&D efforts. Um, while we like to call ourselves primarily a seed stage funding, um, you know, as you can see, we, we really touch everything from um, early discovery to getting into um, manufacturing and, and, and marketing. Um, unlike other uh, federal agencies that you may have worked with in the SBIR program, um, HHS and NIH tend generally not to be the final purchaser of the products and services we support development of uh, through America's Seed Fund. Um, occasionally, uh, awardees um, may find uh, downstream funding opportunities within NIH, but by and large, um, we, we tend not to call what fund what we call uh, phase three um, opportunities. However, um, our recipients leverage government funding in a number of ways. Um, some, depending on the nature of their products, can develop marketable products and go directly um, into commercialization after they complete an SBR and SCTR program. Um, however, um, many of them are able to uh, develop and de-risk their technologies to the point where they can uh, attract that strategic partner and investor um, find that uh, partnership that they need to really bring their innovation to market. Um, we understand that um, when you're developing in a highly regulated marketplace, um, like the biomedical and healthcare space, um, that that can be an extremely expensive process. And we, we try and focus on bridging the gap between that basic research that um, our investigators are trans transitioning out of um, to get to that late stage development where somebody else is going to be um, very excited and interested in, in working with them to get to market. And so how do we do this? Um, they're through uh, two congressionally mandated programs uh, designed to support small business. Um, these are the Small Business Innovation Research Program or SBIR and Small Business Technology Transfer Program or STTR. Um, and you'll hear me collectively refer to these as America's seed fund. Um, it, just uh, keep in mind that we tend to use um, seed fund and SBR, SCTR um, interchangeably. And I will note that uh, at NIH, uh, both of these programs foster the same kinds of R&D. There are a few key differences between them um, that I'm not gonna get into um, extensive detail about today. Um, you can read about this um, more on our website. They, they differ primarily in that STTR is designed to facilitate collaboration with a research institute uh, and create flexibility to include an academic PI in your project without having them be an employee of your company. Um, but besides that, at NIH, uh, they really tend to provide access to the same kinds of resources and funding levels. Um, so we, we we do kind of collectively approach them as one program. And uh, getting to our second myth, and I also hear this one a lot, since as the SBIR program is a bigger program, I have a better chance of getting an SBIR awarded. Also, not true. Um, the size of the program and the funding attached does not correlate with the chance of getting an award. Um, though the SBIR program um, by funding is uh, a, a good deal larger than STTR, the application volume is also larger. 
so smaller programs um, have far fewer applications. Uh, so when, when you're choosing between SBIR and SDTR, we always encourage you to pick the program that provides you with the most flexibility to take advantage of your collaborators expertise and resources. And we will also encourage you to go take a look at our small business success stories. Um, I encourage you to, to take a, a long look at um, all of these stories. Uh, they really showcase the wide variety of companies and modalities and product development and R&D that we support through these programs. Um, you can also see the kinds of additional resources they've been able to use and what kind of follow-on support that they've received. And so one of the hallmarks of NIH's SBIR and STTR programs in particular is its flexibility. If you're familiar with the SBIR and STTR programs, you understand that they feature a phased structure where phase one allows you to demonstrate flexibility Phase one supports continued uh, later stage R&D. You also note that I didn't define what feasibility means, and that's in part due to, uh, because at NIH, we don't have hard and fast requirements about the maturity of technology that we'll work with. Um, if, if you worked um, with other agencies like the Department of Defense, you may have heard about technology readiness levels or TRLs. At NIH, we don't really tend to use them for that much, we're really open to most research and R&D that can be used to demonstrate the commercial potential of a technology and lead into a more concrete phase two project. For some, a lot of investigators, that is very early stage. For many, that is somewhat later stage. Um, and it really just varies about where you are and what your needs are. Um, and wherever that may be, we've got multiple ways to enter our program. You are welcome to submit a standard phase one. Um, however, if you've got a clear idea of what phase two looks like and have some pre preliminary data, we do offer a combined fast track phase one, phase two application, um, which is similar in scope to a phase two application, um, but lets you kind of combine um, both of those phases with um, no funding gap between them. It all goes to peer review once, and if selected from funding, you finish phase one. It, as long as your program officer agrees that you've hit your milestones, um, you can move more or less directly into phase two um, in a very short amount of time. And if you've already uh, demonstrated feasibility using uh, non-SBIR or STTR resources, we do offer a direct to phase two program. Um, and you're welcome to start in phase two um, if your technology is sufficiently developed and, and you're ready for it. Regardless of how you get to phase two, any of these options, we also have a number of programs that help bridge the gap um, between that phase two project and a partner investor or just the marketplace. Um, these are primarily our phase two B program, um, which is just a second uh, sequential phase two award or the Commercialization Readiness Award, which you can get in parallel with a Phase 2 or a Phase 2B award that lets you um, work on more of the um, nuts and bolts of getting to market, uh, solving manufacturing issues, um, getting technical assistance to resolve marketing, intellectual property, um, or regulatory concerns, or do some uh, late stage R&D that's not typically funded by a standard Phase 2 award. Um, that it also lets you work extensively with um, CROs and third parties um, to a degree that's not feasible with a regular SBIR award. Um, another hallmark of our problem of our program at NIH is significant flexibility regarding the budget. Um, you'll note that at NIH and our partners at CDC have a waiver to exceed the SBA budget guidelines for select topics. I've got the guidelines here. Uh, phase one is slightly under $300,000 for a six month to two year project. Phase two is slightly under $2 million for a one to three year project. 
That said, if your project addresses one of the topics on this list, and they vary for all of the different institutes and centers within NIH and CDC, um, you may have a lot of flexibility to exceed these limits. So we really encourage you, and I will say this many times uh, throughout my presentation, to reach out early and discuss your project with a program officer. Um, they will help you um, understand what flexibilities exist um, within each institute and center and uh, optimize, maximize your funding opportunities. Um, between phase one and phase two, phase two B and possibly a CRP award during or after phase two or two B, you can uh, secure some substantial seed stage funding prior to needing to um, secure a, an investor or strategic partner. So a lot of great opportunities to get um, a good amount of funding. And so getting to myth three, it is much harder to get an NIH fast track or direct to phase two award, so I shouldn't bother applying for those. And we, we find that not to be the case. Um, most new projects are phase one, but we do fund very many fast tracks and direct to phase two awards every year. Uh, we also find that success rates tend to be pretty consistent around all of the options for new projects, be that a phase one, fast track, or direct to phase two. Um, so uh, they're very valid options and we do encourage you um, to explore them if they're attractive and fit well with your plans. Again, this is a great topic to discuss with your funding out your program officer before applying. And so um, when you're ready to get started, our website, as I noted, is a wealth of information, including our current open funding opportunities. We have a number of specific funding opportunities that target uh, topics or research areas, but the significant majority of uh, funding goes to what we call investigator-initiated grant applications that come in through our open omnibus solicitations. So the new omnibus solicitations were released earlier this month. I've linked them below. And, uh, and, and so I do encourage you to click on these links, uh, take a look read the entire notice of funding opportunity. It, it's a lot, it's it's very dense, but there's a lot of good, helpful information there. Um, but the, these uh, funding opportunities are open uh, for the next cycle of standard receipt dates. These are September 5th, January 5th, and April 5th. And you'll also find links to our program descriptions and research topics document. Um, that's hosted on our website. This gives you a list of all of the topics of interest for each of the 24 institutes and centers within NIH, as well as all of the centers participating at CDC and FDA. Um, there's a lot of great information, and so if you've got a good idea of what your potential submission might be, you can get a clear idea of how it might fit into um, an institute or center's priorities and uh, make plans to reach out and discuss those plans with a program officer. And so myth four, I should apply to a specific program announcement because targeted funding opportunities have their own dedicated funding. Well, this tends not to be true in all cases. Um, and I do see a lot of uh, awardees and applicants bending over backwards to try and shoehorn their project to fit a targeted solicitation or perhaps one of the topics in our contract solicitation. And in fact, um, about 80% of the grant awards we make go to the omnibus, only five to 10 go to contracts. And we find that between targeted solicitations and the omnibus, the success rates are almost identical. So we really strongly encourage you to take the option that is the best fit for your goals rather than trying to force your project into an opportunity that you think might have dedicated funding or less competition, tends not to work out that way. Um, the omnibus is always a safe option. If the target funding opportunity is a slam dunk for what you're trying to accomplish, that's fantastic. We really encourage you to um, take advantage of them when you can. But otherwise, 
by all means, please use the omnibus. And I did want to mention a couple words about clinical trials uh, and our clinical trial funding opportunities. Uh, not all notices of funding opportunities um, and not all of the institutes and centers within NIH support clinical trials through the SBIR program. So be sure and read um, the information in the program descrip description document very carefully. There will be a run through of each institutes and centers policies and how best to submit a clinical trial to them. I'll also note that the definition of clinical trial at NIH may be broader than you think. Um, the uh, this uh, slide deck links to a website that has a great decision tool. Really encourage you to read through that website, use the decision tool, and figure that out um, before you reach out to us and discuss a potential submission. And just building on that, my project is low risk and only has a few hum human subjects, so it's not a clinical trial. Not the Probably not the case. Um, we've got a very specific definition. So um, if, you're, if you're considering human subjects research of any kind, great idea to re reach out early um, and work through that process to figure out exactly which funding opportunity you would need to use. And so um, moving to our application and review process, how does it work? Um, if you're familiar with the NIH process in general, um, coming from academia, it, it does use the standard NIH review process. Um, so it's a two-tiered process with peer review first, uh, followed by an advisory council review. Um, working with NIH, you do need to prefer, be prepared um, for this process to take some time. Uh, the entire process takes uh, roughly six to nine months um, from start to finish from applying to getting your funding, um, but you will get feedback about three to four months after you submit an application. Um, and this entire process all begins with uh, submission of your application and referral to both a study section and assignment to an institute or center. And all of this is going to happen electronically, whatever solic solicitation you use. Now, this is very important for new companies. We do require four specific solicitations to uh, submit a grant application to NIH. It is very important to start this process early. Um, it can take up to six, uh, six to eight weeks from start to finish in some cases. Um, in some cases, it's faster. If you're looking at applying for our, our September 5th deadline, I, it's not impossible that you could finish um, by, by that point, so I would encourage you to start as soon as possible. Also remember that you will need to complete the first registration um, for SAM.gov and renew it yearly. Um, if you get to um, the point where you're ready to apply and discover that your uh, SAM.gov registration is incomplete or lapsed, there's nothing we can do to help at that point. So please, please, please uh, check these registrations well in advance. Um, you can find instructions about how to get started both in each of our notices of funding opportunity. We've got detailed instructions on the website as well. And um, this will also um, open up a number of application options for you. You are welcome to use uh, the grants.gov workspace to complete the application forms, but we do strongly recommend that you use the NIH alternative we call ASSIST. This is part of our ERA common system and provides um, some error checking features that you don't get through the grants.gov workspace. And particularly if you are new to this process, um, we do offer some resources to help you submit. Uh, there are detailed application instructions to describe each field in our application forms. Um, be sure to check um, after August 5th to make sure you've got the latest and greatest updates to all of these materials. Um, we recently uh, released updated funding opportunities, as I noted before, and there are some pretty significant changes. So we are updating all of these materials. So make sure um, before you apply that you've got the most up-to-date information. 
we do offer an annotated form set that walks you step by step through the application form. Um, not a lot of people find this resource. Um, it can actually be very helpful um, and just um, prevent you from getting caught up in some of the administration administrative issues um, that can uh, cause issues with applications. Uh, we find this to be a great resource for resolving submission errors you get um, and doing so, and it could help you do so well in advance of submitting your application. We also provide sample applications on the website that help you determine what the final proposal should look like. And it can give you a sense of what phase two, uh, phase one applications and fast track proposals um, look like in comparison, how they work and how they differ. We do get a lot of questions about how to structure fast tracks and how to put together specific aims for fast tracks when you're combining both those phases into one document. Um, this can provide some, some concrete assistance in that regard. Uh, and we also have a number of applicant assistance programs to help support novice applicants uh, with submission. So when you reach out to your program officer, be sure and ask if their institute or center offers um, a resource like this. Uh, there are a lot of great options. We've got an open um, applicant assistance program that um, a little less than half of our institutes and centers participate in. If your project is focused on health disparities, um, there's a specific program um, to support those projects through the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And if you're focused in on allergy and infectious diseases, um, that institute does offer an extensive applicant assistance program for both phase one and phase two applicants. And there are links to these programs and how to find more information on, in the slide deck. So myth six, novice applicants to the program are almost never successful at getting awards. And no, this is not the case. We get very many new applicants every cycle, and about 40% of all new awards do go to people who have never received an award before. Um, we, we do strongly encourage new applicants. Um, we're very excited to get applicants from underrepresented um, groups um, from parts of the country that um, are not as well funded as others. Um, these programs are competitive. Um, our overall success rate is about 14 to 15%, um, but we do find that um, um, about uh, the, the success rates for these new companies, um, they're a little bit lower for new applicants, but not very low. So um, don't be discouraged. Uh, we, we, we'd really love to help you um, come in and take advantage of our resources. And as I noted, the most important piece of advice that I have is to talk with the NIH well in advance of an application deadline. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, it can be a very difficult um, process to navigate for some people that don't necessarily know um, how to engage with us or understand where their project may fit in. We do have a list of small business program managers on our website that provides direct contacts that you are welcome to reach out to. Um, if you think your project fits within their institute or center's interests, if you don't, you can always send an email to seedinfo at nih.gov, provide us a brief overview of your technology and your planned project goals. And we're very happy to help make some suggestions to connect you with uh, the right program officer and institute. Um, really, and don't be shy. Ah, and this is a, another um, big point of confusion um, that, that we hear a lot. The seven applications are submitted to a specific institute, so I need to choose the institute and study section for my application. You absolutely do not. Applications to the omnibus are submitted just to NIH and HHS. When you submit them, the Center for Scientific Review will review your application and make the assignment to the institute and study section that it um, most closely aligns with. Uh, this tends to be why it's so important to contact a program officer in advance. 
Each of the institutes and centers have different resources, different budget guidelines, particularly if you're applying against a waiver topic. That said, you are very welcome to make requests. Each application package contains an assignment request form um, that you should use for this. Uh, we, we no longer use the cover letter for this purpose, um, but you'll be able to make um, a request for up to three different institutes and centers in priority order, three different study sections. You can also point out individuals or companies that may be in conflict with your uh, project. So nobody from that is that company um, or those investigators won't be selected to re review your project. Um, if you're concerned that the review panel might not have a specific kind of expertise or a specific kind of um, investigator that you think is critical to getting a fair review for your, your submission, um, you, you can certainly request that as well. And so once you've submitted uh, your proposal and the application is assigned, it will go to that study section um, it is assigned to you. A scientific review officer, who will be your primary point of contact at this point, recruits peer reviewers with the appropriate expertise to review each grant application. You'll have at least three reviewers assigned to an application. Occasionally, you'll see more, just depending on the nature of your technology and the structure of the panel. And these reviewers will use published review criteria to score the application. So all of the instructions and review criteria that reviewers will use, um, you will see in advance. So be sure and read through the notices of funding opportunity and make sure that your proposal addresses all of the questions that these reviewers are going to be asked to consider. Um, this is a great way to help uh, build out your research plan and make sure it's really responsive and uh, addressing the points that we, we think are important. Um, I will repeat that these review criteria um, have been updated in the, in the past year to focus more on commercialization potential. So read them closely. It may change the way that experienced uh, applicants um, write their proposals, particularly for phase one. Um, and this can be really critical. So you'll receive a final score as a result of the discussion at your review meeting. Um, all of this will be summarized in a summary statement that you'll receive um, within, um, within a month, usually much, much more quickly after the review meeting happens. Um, and then all of this information will be given back to the um, institute or center you're assigned to, and they will make a funding decision based on this information. And, and so um, you, you'll get um, this information um, a lot of the time, most of the time. In, in fact, if the program is competitive, you might not get funded. Um, this is discouraging for a lot of people. Um, and uh, that's why we bring up this myth. My application didn't get discussed or funded. It's a waste of time to try again. Absolutely not. Be prepared to resubmit. Um, persistence um, really pays off for this program. Uh, we find that uh, for new applications, we see an overall success rate of 11%. Um, for companies that resubmit, we see that go up, up to 18%. Um, so that's a pretty significant um, improvement in your chances. Uh, we also suggest that you reach out directly to um, study sections in the Center for Scientific Review and offer to be a reviewer. Uh, this can be a great way to get a clear um, understanding of the re review process and learn what makes a strong application. Um, really great experience. And it's most important not to get discouraged. Um, you know, I've been there as well. Reviews tend to get straight to the point and they can seem very harsh. Um, don't take it personally. We, we um, encourage you to discuss your outcomes and next steps with your program officer. Uh, and then you'll have the opportunity to resubmit and respond uh, if you like. Um, you can always come back with a new application that has no ties to your previous submission if that's your, pre your preference and you just want a fresh start. And so after the scientific review, um, the application goes back to the Awarding Institute or Center's Advisory Council for a second tier review and approval for funding. 
They typically review an overall SBR SDHR funding plan rather than individual applications, but if they choose to, they can look at any application that they're asked to consider. For uh, select applications that are chosen for funding at this point, um, the due diligence process starts and you will hear from a grants management uh, specialist and officer who will work with you and your program officer to confirm that you meet the eligibility requirements and also making sure that your proposal is compliant with policy. Uh, and, and they'll work with you pretty extensively to revise budget off items as needed or other small issues with your project. Um, we do try to be as flexible as the law allows to fix issues in your application. And what we do have to work hard to make sure that there's an even playing field for all applicants. Um, we, we try very hard not to penalize applicants for administrative errors. So if you find small issues, don't worry, we, we can usually help fix them. Um, um, and they often will not jeopardize your chance at funding. And just want to reiterate that the peer reviewers, um, though you're getting direct feedback from them, they are not making the funding selections. Uh, this is happening at the institutes and centers. And, and in fact, um, each institute and center director um, is making the final decision um, to fund your application or not, regardless of what you may read in your summary statement. And then shifting gears a little bit, want to address um, this myth. The small business programs only provide money. And, and in fact, we don't. Um, the seed office provides uh, technical and business assistance, education programs, partnering investment opportunities, and commercialization support for our awardees. Um, to take advantage of most of these, uh, for, for better or worse, you, you do need to get your foot in the door. But uh, once you do, we've got a lot of great resources that you can take advantage of. Um, these include uh, technical and business assistance programs, or TAVA, as you may hear them referred to. We, we want our companies to succeed, um, and so we provide a number of different options for TAVA. Um, you can get funding as part of your award and uh, secure your own vendor to provide TAVA services. Um, we also provide a different phase one and phase two options for centralized services. Um, so you, you don't need to do these yourself. You'll be offered the opportunity to apply after you receive your award and can participate in the needs assessment program in phase one or the phase two tablet consulting services program in phase two. So if you are requesting your own funding, um, you can request up to $6,500 per year in phase one up to $50,000 per project in phase two. In some cases, um, you can also add this funding after you receive your award. Um, there's a link here to a notice where you can get more information about that. But we do strongly recommend that you um, include this as part of your application rather than trying to um, secure money afterward. Um, and I'm not gonna get into um, detail about what we can and can't support. Um, but there's a lot of great guidance in the slide deck and in our website as well. And, and, and generally, um, a, a, as long as you're securing expertise specific to your funded technology um, and help getting it to market, and it's not part of the specific R&D you're doing as part of your specific aims, um, you, you can get a lot of great um, additional resources to help support your commercialization goals. Um, and then the needs assessment program for phase one awardees provides an unbiased third party assessment by RTI and innovation advisors to help small businesses identify the most pressing product development needs, product development needs uh, across uh, four, spe four specific dimensions. Um, they provide uh, high priority steps to improve the commercialization potential overall of your project. And it can really help you plan your phase two application out, including that uh, $50,000 um, technical and business assistance funding request on phase two. Um, so it's it's a really great resource to help sort of jumpstart your activity, your commercialization um, um, planning, if, if you're really not clear about where you need to go. The uh, phase two technical and business assistance consulting services provides 
uh, small businesses with consulting services up to $50,000 from independent vendors. Uh, participants in this program will select one need amongst these four areas um, and uh, be matched with uh, a number of vendors that can provide these services. And it's 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 really a great opportunity to get that expert consulting to um, do a marketing study, um, get a handle on what the reimbursement um, um, landscape looks like for your particular um, product and market, uh, get some good IP advice, or plan out an IND submission. Um, great resource. And lastly, we also offer a variety of other innovator support. Um, this includes regulatory and business development consultants. Um, you see pictured here, all these, all these lovely smiling people, um, a lot of uh, great resources. Um, participation in entrepreneurial support programs and even a number of uh, industry partnering and investment opportunities. Um, we do put a lot of effort into getting um, our awardees to events like Bio, MedTech, Angel Capital Association, and so forth, um, and pitching directly to investors and strategic partners. Um, so it can be really a transformational experience. And then we also provide access to um, entrepreneurial support programs, the i and NIH program, c 3 i program, um, administrative supplements to promote diversity. Um, all of these opportunities can really uh, enhance both um, you know, your experience um, and your product development efforts. And lastly, I, I did want to hi highlight that uh, SBR, STTR diversity supplement, um, and there's a link to this program um, in our slide deck. Uh, to be eligible, you need to have an active phase one or phase two or a fast track award. Um, the project and budget um, periods must be with, within um, the currently approved project and budget for the existing parent award. Um, and you can submit applications on a rolling basis. But what, what this lets you do essentially is secure between 5,000 to over $100,000 worth of support, uh, depending on the career level of a candidate that can help um, enhance the diversity of the biomedical workforce in some form or fashion. Um, we, we don't specify how that needs to be. That's, that's up to your candidate to justify. But it, it's a really great um, resource to add expertise to your pro project and bring some uh, fantastic investigators um, into the workforce. And so my last myth, um, NIH bureaucrats are unapproachable and I should minimize my discussions with them. And um, yeah, please, uh, we're very happy to hear from you. Um, uh, both the seat office and program officers across all of the institutes and centers, um, our scientific re review officers as well. We're all here to help. We, we want to help. We're, we're very happy to have discussions with you. We are busy people, um, so it may take us a little bit of time to get to you, but um, really, um, we encourage you um, to reach out, um, have a discussion. We've got a lot of different avenues to engage. Um, they're all listed here, but um, We'll, we'll answer your questions um, how and um, when we can. So um, with that, uh, that's uh, my presentation and I'm very happy to address questions um, as soon as our hosts are ready for it. Thank you so much, Adam, um, for your presentation. We definitely have a few questions ready for you. Great. So are you ready? I am. Great. So it says from Maria P. It says, is there is a support for mental health therapy private practice to assist with growth? So um, our projects uh, or our, our, our funding is um, pr uh, focused on um, supporting research and development for uh, new products, processes or service. Um, so we're not really able, able to help you expand um, existing operations, but if you are looking at developing um, a, a new product or service for um, me mental health, um, that's absolutely something that we support through um, the National Institute of Mental Health and a number of other institutes and centers. Um, so, you know, um, if you've got a specific idea of how you'd like to improve 
um, mental health care. Um, we're, we're, we're very interested in hearing it. Thank you so much, Adam, for answering Maria's question. Mm -hmm. Next, um, I have Alexi, Lexi um, Guan. He's asking, what is the essential bare minimum of documents that we have to submit to SBIR proposal and budget? Seems to that that paperwork is quite extensive. Oh, Alexi, unfortunately, you're, you're right. It's um, the application process um, and forms are extensive. Um, the best way to get a handle on the bare minimum is to go to our website and look at those um, uh, sample applications that I mentioned before. Um, there's a lot. I mean, the big pieces are going to be your research plan. Um, if you're doing a phase two application, um, you also have a commercialization plan as well. You'll need to describe your facilities and equipment, um, provide bio sketches for all of the um, key personnel and the, the, the budget and budget justification are the other big pieces. Um, but um, there's a there's a lot of a lot of a lot of paperwork and it really depends on the kind of application you're submitting. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a straightforward answer for you, but uh, really take a look at those samples for kind of the clearest answer. Thank you so much, Adam. The next question is, what is the uh, what is feasibility? Um, does it mean working customers might pay or end users will use it and pay for both for clinical slash behavioral public work? Does it uh, feasibility be I think he misspelled it or uh, feasibility, I think. Else. Means three tech, no risk, and no clinical risk. So I'm myself confused with the question. So uh, it, it's it's getting out, uh, I think, getting at um, what, what feasibility means to us. And, and so when we say feasibility, um, we, we don't define exactly um, what you need to accomplish to establish feasibility, but we're, we're, we're talking about um, performing. Um, enough research to, to show that you've got a solution that could potentially address um, some kind of unmet need in the healthcare space. Um, that could be um, demonstrating that you've got the potential to improve on the existing standard of care, maybe reduce the cost of care. Um, it could be um, reducing the length of hospital stays. It's, it's really pretty open-ended, but it's really kind of just showing that you've got a uh, technology that has potential in some form or fashion to lead to a new innovative product. Um, he also submitted another question. He says, is there is a way to talk to Adam? Absolutely. So that's a great Before question. Are worth submitting? Yeah. So um, we're, we're, we're very happy to take a look at um, sort of an overview of your project. Um, and on our website, we've got... Um, a helpful infographic um, that says that's titled "How to Apply." Um, one of these, um, one of the sections of the infographic um, covers um, reaching out to us um, and speaking to a program officer, and it gives you kind of some hints about organizing your thoughts and presenting your proposal in a way that's sort of easy for us to um, evaluate for fit. Um, discuss uh, which institute or center at NIH um, you should consider. Um, targeting your application to, and um, you know wh whether it's a good match for the SBIR program or, or not. And it, it may not be, but we're very happy to have that discussion with you. Great, he also submitted another question. He says, can you elaborate a bit more on Omnibus versus targeted solicitation and how can we propose entirely a new idea and see if that fits somewhere? Right, so if you are proposing an entirely new idea, you are always welcome to submit that to the omnibus um, as long as it's within the biomedical um, healthcare or related life science space. Um, anything that is of interest to NIH, CDC, and FDA um, can always be submitted to the omnibus. Um, we will figure out where it fits best. You don't need to make that determination. Um, you, you're, you're welcome to try and, and have that discussion in advance because there are benefits, but um, yeah, um, you can always use the omnibus for anything um, in, in that space. 
we do publish a number of targeted solicitations, um, and these may help address uh, gaps in research that we don't see applications coming in in specific areas. It could be for, say, in support of um, a number of specialized initiatives we've got funding for, like the Brain Initiative, um, funding things related to, um, say, Alzheimer's and other neurological um, and mental health issues, um, the HEAL Initiative, the Cancer Moonshot, and so forth. Um, so the, the, they're out there, and um, we, we do encourage applications to them. But by all means, the, the omnibus is always open to everything and safe to apply to. Thank you, Adam. Mm -hmm. So we have another question here from Gary. If one supplies for phase one to phase two, oh, what happened? I believe that's called fast track. Is it possible mm -hmm. to have a plan approved for phase one alone if their review committee is not ready to approve phase two at this time? Or would that require a resubmission as a phase one only application? Um, so for grants, um, that would require a, a resubmission. Um, you, you, you do need to um, have that entire plan approved at that time. Um, for our contracts, which I haven't spoken about today, um, that'll be another <laughs> another webinar. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility, but generally speaking, yeah, um, you, you do need to come back and resubmit if your phase two um, plan is not well received as part of a fast track application. Great. So we have an Anthony asking, my company is in New Jersey. Who is my NIH advisor? Uh, so we, we don't have um, specific uh, advisors for um, at NIH anyway, um, uh, for, for specific states, although you've got a lot of great resources, um, which um, our, our hosts today play a big part in. Um, we, we, we tend to uh, focus on um, specific areas of research. Um, so um, you can always reach out to us at seedinfo at nih.gov to figure out exactly what that might be for your particular um, technology. We have a question by Patrick. It says, does NIH tend to pick up on other existing SBIR proposals, e.g., AFWERX, comma, Navy SBIR that have capability but might need adaptation work for submission specifically for an NIH agency? Um, so we don't directly. Um, you know, that said, if you've submitted something to, um, say, one of those DOD agencies um, or perhaps NSF, who's another agency that um, supports a lot of. Um, biomedical and health related research, um, you're also welcome to submit that project to NIH as well. Um, we, we won't both be able to fund your project, um, but we can both consider it. Um, also, if you do a phase one SBIR or STTR project at one of those agencies, NIH will also consider um, accepting your phase two application. Um, so that's something that we have the flexibility to do. All right, we have one more minute for one last question. We have Rama. Um, it says, we make unique software for clinical trials. Will that allow access grants that you have described here? Um, th that really depends on um, kind of what, what you're trying to get funding for. Uh, if you're looking to um, create some in innovative new ways to maybe plan or manage clinical trials, it, it's possible there might be some opportunities there. Um, we, we really need to take a closer look at your plans, but um, institutes like the, or a uh, center rather, the uh, National Center uh, for Advancing um, um, Translational Sciences or NCATS uh, does focus on a lot of technologies that enhance um, uh, clinical practice and clinical trials. So it's certainly a possibility. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for answering all those questions. We are thankful to have you. I'm going to share my screen. We had a bunch of participants. Thank you so much for everyone who submitted their questions. Uh, I will be sharing my screen now.
um, I would like to remind everyone, if you want a copy of this webinar, make sure you submit your quick survey. It takes less than three minutes and you will get tons of resources and you will also provide us with feedback. Um, make sure you scan the QR code to request counseling at no cost, uh, wherever you are, we're here for you. Next week, we are very excited for our upcoming webinar. It's the celebration of the SBA 70th anniversary. So learn about the SBA's impact in small business resources with John Blockstock. He's an SBA NJ uh, district director. So he will have great, great information for all of you. I will be hosting that webinar as well. So make sure you scan the QR code right now on your screen to take advantage and register for next week. That will be Thursday, August 3rd, same time. Thank you so much for all the participants. Please remember this was brought to you by the Small Business Development Center of the state of New Jersey tech team. We help innovators grow. We provide no cost pitch to proposal consulting, training and events, training, training and events starting at zero cost and exclusive small business tech resources. We are here to help you. Please point your camera towards the QR code so you are able to learn more about us. Thank you and see you next week. Have a great day. Oh,